right, that was a mouthful. I didn't realize you'd be reading all of that, but thank you for the beautiful introduction. Um, I'm super excited to be here with you all today. Um, and if you have any questions as we go throughout, I'll kind of orient you to the presentation and the slides, which I think we'll be sharing in the chat today. Um, but if you have any questions, comments, please feel free to just pop those in the chat as we go along. I would love for you to be interactive and for this to be a space where you feel comfortable enough to get some deeper information. We have a short time today, uh, so I will be going through quite a bit and I will have a ton of resources linked here for you to walk away with and kind of process on your own time. So at the end, I will share my contact information so that if you have any questions or concerns, comments or need support with anything, uh, you can hit me up and, and we can work on giving you that support that you might need. So we're gonna take it away. Please, please feel free to pop into the chat at any time. Um, I wanted to share a little bit about myself. Uh, Tanya gave quite an extensive background on me, but I wanted to just share a little bit about myself personally. Um, my pronouns are she, her, hers. Uh, this is my little Google classroom that I like to use, but it's got some pictures of my family over here at San Diego Pride. Um, it's also got a large picture of my son who's now in third grade. His name is Hendrix, and he has really helped to inform a lot of my understanding of the educational system from a parent perspective. And so that has kind of helped me to build some of those parent, family, and community components into the work that I do. Um, if you open up the slide deck that was shared in the chat, this is a PDF document. And on this page, almost everything is clickable and will take you actually to other links. So you'll see a book list here um, that will actually take you to a recommended student book list for LGBT texts. You'll see some of my favorite artists and some of my favorite musicians. The flag up here is also clickable, and so it will take you to some further LGBT resources. So that's just a little bit about me. Uh-oh, that's not what we wanted. Give me just a second here. That's taking you to one of the links. There we go. I clicked on one of the things I told you to click on. I did it again. No. Let's see if we can go through here. I got a new computer, y'all, and it's a struggle bus, but we're going to make it. So we're going to kick it off with some terminology today. We're also going to get into some law and policy in a bit, and we're going to close with some best, best practices and resources. But I like to always start with that acronym that we used in the title, LGBTQIA. And I wanted to make sure that everybody in this space has a decent understanding of what those letters represent, um, and what kind of separates gender identity versus sexual orientation, which is a question that I get a lot. Um, so I'm going to briefly run through this. The L is for lesbian, the G is for gay, B bisexual, T transgender, the Q typically represents two communities, queer, or it could represent questioning. And for education professionals, we find that so many of our young people um, are in that category of kind of questioning their sexual orientation or gender identity, trying different things on really as they go throughout adolescence. Uh, the I is intersex and the A represents asexual. Sometimes you'll see that A standing for ally. Um, I veer more towards just keeping asexual there. Allies are great, we love our allies, um, but in the acronym, always trying to center those in the community I think is really important. You'll see the color coding here um, represents the difference between sexual orientation, which is a sexual attraction to another individual so lesbian, gay, bisexual, asexual, and queer fall into that category. Um, and the gray represent gender identity, which is a distinct concept from sexual orientation. And that would be transgender, transgender um, intersex, and potentially queer. So there is, you'll see on this slide, uh, an arrow here. Anytime you see that arrow throughout the presentation, in the PDF that was put into the chat, you can actually click on that and it will take you to another resource that kind of gets into the terminology and some of the representational flags you see here. We're gonna get into um, a little bit about the difference between gender identity and sexual orientation. I really thought this quote was a great way of kind of uh, conceptualizing this. And it says the difference between gender identity and sexual orientation is the difference between who you are and whom you love. So that's a great way of kind of separating those two concepts. But we're going to dig a little bit deeper, and I'm going to share a couple of resources that I've used and I think are really helpful, especially for counselors, social workers, and just general student mental health support. 
Um, gender identity is something that we see in students that are in preschool, kindergarten, gender identity starts forming very early, much earlier than sexual orientation typically does. So we have young people as soon as two and three understanding um, gender stereotypes. We have toddlers that are able to choose quote, girl toys and boy toys, um, which means that at that age, we also see some young people who are able to identify that their likes or their presentation differ from what society has said that they should like or how they should express their gender. So this idea of being trans or gender non-binary or gender non-conforming can start very young. Um, by early grade school, people can talk about their gender identity. Um, and then we start seeing this idea of gender dysphoria, which is the distress that someone feels when there's a difference between their gender identity and the anatomy of their body. When those two things don't quite feel like they're aligning, this sense of dysphoria can start to occur. And then in 2020, I just wanted to share um, a study of adults here, transgender adults, 73% of transgender women and 78% of transgender men reported that they first experienced gender dysphoria by age seven. So starting young with this information for students, um, knowing how to appropriately support these students is incredibly important. This is one of the tools that I love to use to help folks kind of understand gender a little bit more. Um, so I'm going to go through this and then I'm going to share a couple of tools that I personally have used with younger students, early elementary, all the way through middle and high school that hopefully you can take away with you. Um, you'll see that this is, it's got that little arrow, so you can click on this document. It's from GLSEN, which is a national organization, nonprofit that supports educators. Um, but we're going to start in the bottom left corner where it says sex assigned at birth. This is what the medical community typically labels people as they're born, and there are these three options, male, female, and intersex. Okay, so this is the gender that somebody assigns to us based on typically our physical anatomy. Next, we're going to hop up to the center where it says gender identity. Gender identity is how we see ourselves. The gender that we see ourselves as has how we show up in our gender, um, who we believe ourselves to be, who we are internally. Then we jump over to the bottom right, which is gender expression. And this is how we want to display our gender, right? So this might be um, the clothes that we choose to wear, the haircut, the makeup that we wear or don't wear, facial piercings, tattoos, all of the ways that we express our gender on the outside. Um, and then we go up to the top where you'll see gender attribution. And this is how your gender is perceived by others. So based on how you present, um, this is what other people perceive you to be. And you'll notice that I opened up today by sharing my pronouns. That is a great way of sharing information about yourself and learning information about other people that takes us out of the position of making assumptions or attributing a gender to them. And it really lets people um, define their gender for themselves. So we know exactly how to identify them and what their preference is. This is one of the documents I was sharing. I've used this a ton with young students all the way up through uh, middle and elementary school. It's called the Gender Unicorn, and it's provided by Trans Student Educational Resources, which is a great organization. You can click on it and go to their website because they update this as new terminology and identifications are added. Um, but it basically goes through gender identity, gender expression, which we just looked at, and it allows for students to look at themselves on a spectrum, right? So instead of just identifying as either female or male or something other, they can use the little indicators there and kind of put themselves on a spectrum in one or all of those areas. It allows just for a lot more inclusivity in terms of how we allow students to identify. So you'll see that repeated through gender expression, and then you'll get down to the bottom, physical attraction and emotional attraction. So that's the part that I tend to use with the upper, you know, middle school and high school students. The gender identity and expression are great tools for our younger students um, in elementary school to talk a little bit more about how they identify. Uh, we're gonna get into some specific laws and policy in just a second around transgender students, gender non-conforming students in particular. So I wanted to make sure that there was a foundational understanding here of those groups. So we're gonna walk through this and I'll kind of share with you, again, these are linked so you can click on them to get some more information on these definitions. Um, but the first we're gonna start with is actually number three, 
uh, over here on the right, which is cisgender. Cisgender is a term for somebody who exclusively identifies as their sex assigned at birth. So I'll give you an example. At birth, I was um, assigned female. They put female on my birth certificate, sent me home. Today, I identify as female. So how I identify internally matches what was assigned to me at birth. And so the term that would be used to describe that is cisgender. Um, some identities that fall within that category are man, woman, boy, girl, tends to be the one we're most familiar with. If you look over here on the left, you'll see transgender. Transgender is a term for anyone whose gender identity does not match that gender that was assigned at birth or the sex that was assigned at birth. So somebody who is born and assigned male and later identifies as female or non-binary, um, that would be that would fall under the category of transgender. Some identities that fall into that scope are a trans man, trans woman, a non-binary person, two-spirit, or third gender. Those are just some examples um, and not an exhaustive list. And then at the bottom, um, this one is a little bit trickier for folks and we have a lot of students who actually fall into this category. So I like to make sure I include it. This is gender non-conforming. And this is a term for anyone who challenges society's traditional gender roles and or expression. I consider myself, although I am cisgender, I also think that my gender expression tends to be a bit non-conforming and unconventional. So I feel like I would fall in that gender non-conforming. I wear men's clothes um, and sometimes I wear makeup, sometimes I don't. I have a short haircut. So the way that I express my gender does not match societal norms typically. Um, some identities in this umbrella area would be an androgynous person like myself, a uh, drag king or queen, a gender queer person might identify as gender non-conforming, a masculine woman or a feminine man. Again, this is not an exhaustive list, but just to give you an idea of what might qualify in that area. I'm going to pause and just say, I've, I know I'm throwing a ton of information at you, and if there are questions, please throw those in the chat now or as we go along and I would love to respond to those for anybody who has them. We're gonna get a little bit into that data right now. Um, I think this is important to have. These are taken from some really credible and popular youth reports that are done by a couple of amazing organizations. Um, they tend to do yearly reports on student climate and student wellness for LGBT youth. Um, with COVID, they were unable to do the survey in the last couple of years. So these are taken from the most recent surveys. This one is from Human Rights Campaign, it's done in 2018. If you click up there where it says LGBT Youth Report, you can see the entire report. I highly recommend it. Um, but I just wanted to share some youth experiences uh, at both home and school. And so if you look on the left, you'll see that only about 24% of LGBT youth can definitely be themselves as an LGBT person at home. That's less than a quarter of our students. 67% uh, of LGBT youth hear their families make negative comments about LGBT people. And 78% of youth not out to their parents hear their families make negative comments about LGBT people. Over here on the right, you'll see some information about school, which I found to be kind of interesting because at school, you actually see a higher number of students who feel like they can definitely be themselves at school. Um, and so that's, that's comforting, but we're still hovering around that 25% mark. Um, so there's definitely work to be done. Only 13% of LGBT youth report hearing positive messages about being LGBT at school. Um, and only 26% of LGBT youth report that they always feel safe in a classroom. So safety is a huge concern for this community both emotional safety as well as physical safety. This um, comes from a separate report. This is a report done by GLSEN. It's a school climate survey for it nas nationally for LGBT youth. And I wanted to share this um, as we talk about safety because it puts actually into locations where students are reporting they feel least safe. And you'll see that the, the highest numbers are those spaces that tend to be unsupervised, unmonitored, bathrooms, uh, locker rooms, PE or gym class. And that's not just because they're not monitors and there's an element of physical danger that comes with that, but these are places where specifically our trans and non-binary students are being forced to use facilities that may or may not align with their gender identity. And so there's this sense of emotional distress um, and unsafety that comes with having to enter spaces that don't align 
with your identity. These are taken from that same survey that I just mentioned, and these are specific to middle and high school experiences. So you'll see on the left, the percentages around trans students, um, unable to use the name or pronoun that match their gender, over half of our students cannot use those names or pronouns at school. 80% are harassed or assaulted, 25% avoid bathrooms, wait all day uh, to go home to use the restroom. 64% are prevented from wearing clothes that match their gender identity and 83% feel unsafe at school because of their gender. So um, again, definitely work to be done. My hope today is that you leave with some tools to help you start to engage in this work of supporting LGBT youth. Um, I think one of the most important tools that we have as educators, especially here in California, is understanding what laws and policies we have that protect not only us, um, but protect our students who are LGBTQ plus identifying. This year, 2022 uh, is on par to be the highest anti-LGBTQIA plus legislative year in history. So I put a little bit of information here at the bottom. Uh, right now, activists are tracking about 280 bills that have been filed um, that are designed to remove rights and accessibility for LGBT youth. They center around bathroom use, locker room use, uh, sports, gender affirming care. And so now more than ever, I think it's important to make sure we know what our obligations and our support are in terms of law and policy. And in California, we've got some great ones. So I pulled what I thought might be just some of the most relevant ones for this group. There are more. And so going back, if you click on the screen here, you can actually see a more exhaustive list of laws and policies for LGBT youth. Um, but today we're just gonna look at a small handful, starting off with federal law and policy. So you'll see here there, there are four. Um, the First Amendment, free speech, students have a right to be out. They have a right to talk about their gender identity, their sexual orientation. Um, with FERPA, students have a constitutional right to privacy. And we'll get a little bit more into that um, in just a bit. Title IX, um, talks about students able to access facilities and sports activities that align with their gender identity and not just their sex assigned at birth. And the Equal Access Act is great because we have a lot of students who are looking to start clubs and support groups at school. And so them knowing that under the law, they have a right to meet. If other students and other organizations are meeting on campus, they have that right as well is really helpful to a lot of our GSAs um, and rainbow support clubs that we see popping up in support of students. Some of the state laws that I wanted to pull out for this group today, um, I thought these would be especially relevant are this one here. So you'll see AB 1266. Um, this provides guidance to schools so that they can make sure that all students have equal opportunity um, one of the big things that is part of this is that students have a right to participate in after school clubs, um, extracurricular activities, athletics that align with their gender identity. And this is regardless of their biological sex. So in your student information system, um, their legal gender does not take precedence over their gender identity. And that's something that is incredibly helpful for students and adults to know. To that end, We've created a document um, that you'll see up here, it's clickable, which is a gender support plan so that students can define for us which athletic teams they feel they belong on, which restrooms and facilities do they want to use. Um, and we can track that and make sure that we are acting as allies around the school and campus, ensuring that students can use those proper facilities um, by upstanding and making sure that other staff are aware of the students' needs. There is, um, CSBA has a really great, a couple really great documents. I particularly like this one here, which talks about preferred names and pronouns for students. So you can see the entire um, policy brief if you click over here on the right, but preferred names and pronouns are things that come up a lot from teachers, counselors, social workers, and also from students. So knowing that students have a right to change their name or pronouns at school, is a great start, um, but also knowing and being aware of the privacy that students are afforded when they do change their name or pronouns is also really helpful because for a lot of our LGBT youth, 
um, it becomes a safety concern if they change their name and pronouns at school and then they have teachers or administrators or support staff that might be contacting home and sharing um, that information because students do have a right to privacy and it can be a safety concern. It's important that we know that we need to get permission from a student before sharing their transgender status um, or gender non-conforming status with anybody else, with the principal, with another teacher, with another student and with family. The student has to give us express permission because that is their constitutional right to privacy. There are a couple of documents. So I just shared that gender support plan that we've created here that you can use as a template. Um, and it's actually created using the support from Gender Spectrum, which is another really great organization. You also can access their document here. And if you click on the little red rectangle, um, there's a video that goes along with their gender support plan to kind of walk you through that document and familiarize you with how to use it, when to use it, where to keep it. Um, so it's a great video I recommend if you're using gender support plans in your school or district, just to give you a little bit more information about how to operate with it. Um, I kind of talked about this here, but I just wanted to really reinforce this idea that school staff, again, cannot disclose any information that might reveal a student's transgender status to anybody else on campus, whether it's uh, an adult or a student, administrator, counselor, social worker, or parents, unless they're required to do so by law or the, the student has authorized that we can do this. Sometimes we have students who will actually ask us to help them inform their parents or other teachers. In that case, it's totally okay. We have express consent from the student. Um, but unless we have that, it's important that the privacy and confidentiality of that student are maintained. The next one I wanted to share um, is AB 2246. This is a suicide prevention law. And because studies have shown that LGBT youth are four times more likely to attempt suicide than their non-LGBTQ peers, um, and that students more often than not, the person that they would turn to when experiencing um, suicidal ideation or thoughts of depression was a close friend or a teacher, this bill gives schools the right to create tools to aid in suicide prevention. Um, it addresses youth suicide prevention by requiring actually schools to have policies in place. And so this is a great one to have in your pocket. You can click it to see the entire text here. Um, and then if you are operating within a district or within a school, it's really important to consider what policies you have, board policies or administrative procedures you have in place. Make sure that those over here on the right, I put policies don't impact youth unless they are known, applied, and accountability is held. So you might have some really great policies enacted in your school and district, but making sure that people know what those are and what their rights are within the law can be incredibly helpful because we see a lot of schools that have amazing board policies um, that people just don't know about. So if it is within your scope of control or influence to share that information, especially in honor of Pride Month that's coming up, that might be a good time to orient people back to some of the existing policies that you might have at your school or district. Ebony, we did have a question in the chat. Yeah. Um, if the student does not want anyone to know, how can we support them with the plan? So that is a great question. If the student wants nobody to know, the plan would really be something that would be like a confidential note. And so I've definitely worked with students um, like that. And the video would be helpful. I'll also be sharing my contact information. The plan gets a little bit tricky because once you take something and you put it in writing and you put it in a student's information file, parents can request access to that and will have access to the gender support plan. So in some cases, if you know it might be a safety concern, um, I would say the best course of action would be to sit down and just talk with the student, ask them their preferences, because the best form of support in that case might be not making a, a written plan and just asking how you as the individual they've chosen to share this with can support. And that might show up you know, in many different ways, but it might be, you know, hey, can you come stand outside of this classroom because I've been getting bullied here? Um, all of those things, you know, the little things that students might share that would be supportive, as opposed to putting it into a written document. That might not be the best course of action 
for a student like that. And if a student um, does not want anybody to know, then maybe the plan isn't the best. Sometimes we have students who are what we call stealth. They're transgender um, and their gender expression aligns with their gender identity. And they just don't want people to know that they are trans, right? They just wanna show up and walk through the world as their gender identity. Um, and so for those students, we sometimes will do a version of the plan where we sit with them and we ask, which bathrooms would you like to use? And we say, you know, you're entitled to use whichever bathrooms, locker rooms, sporting teams that you would like to use. And the way that they want the support uh, is by us sharing with other adults who might push back on that. Hey, I've talked to this student and they are allowed to use this restroom, as opposed to sharing personal information about their gender identity status. So we can make it about the event or the space and less about that student's gender identity, if that makes sense. But I don't think the gender support plan is always you know, the, the best course of action. It's really about working with that student and seeing what their, what their needs are. And then I did put a link to your SDCOE webpage, but is there a specific place where um, participants can find board policies by SDCOE that exist to protect LGBT youth? Yes, so you can go on the SDCOE website. I don't have it off the top of my head because we just got a whole new website but you can search all of the board policy and control F to find LGBT specific policies. I'm actually working with our legal team right now to update our policies, um, which is an arduous task with so many, um, but I'll have some resources at the end of the presentation that I'll kind of orient you to. I'm not gonna go into each one that I think might be helpful as well. But right now my sad answer is you'll have to go on the website and just kind of poke around because I don't have the specific link right now. And I see a question in the chat. What if parent requests school staff to call their child by their birth name and sex, even when the student is openly asking staff to call them by something else? So the student has a right to go by the name and pronouns that they are requesting, um, and so not the parents. That's our legal obligation as employees of a school or a, dist a public school or district. Um, there's a, a toolkit that is at the back of this presentation and the resources that gives some language around how to respond to parents who might be you know, upset or really, really want their child to go by a specific name or um, gender identity at school, but it is our legal obligation to respond to what the student is asking uh, because this, is, this, this violates uh, a harassment law. If we're consistently calling a student by a name or a gender identity or gender marker that they are asking us not to. Um, and it is our job to be responsive to that student despite what the parent may or may not agree with. But there's some great language and some of the tools I'll share with you at the end to kind of address that concern by parents in a way that helps them to understand what our, our obligations are as educators. Hopefully that was helpful. Yes. Um, we got some more questions. So this is a hot topic. Does every school need to go by these policies? Juan, if you could clarify for me which policies um, you're referring to, I think that would be helpful. And then what about their name in the guardian in the graduation program? We've always gone by the legal name, parent wants the legal name, student does not. Again, this, oh, that might be your, your answer. This goes back to the, we need to be responsive to students. That's our legal, legal obligation. I'm Tammy, I'm sorry, Tammy. Um, that is our legal obligation. So if a student requests in the graduation program, in the yearbook, uh, on their ASB card, a specific name and pronoun marker or gender marker, it is our responsibility legally to follow that. Because should we not, should we call the student by a name or pronouns that they are actively telling us they do not want, it is considered an act of discrimination. So I think being equipped with the tools on how to respond to parents in that situation is helpful. And also having some of these um, links to where parents can read more about our legal responsibility. I would direct them in that case to AB 1266, which I shared a couple of slides ago. Um, or the CSBA document that talks specifically about um, the legalities around names and pronouns. Love your questions. Please keep them coming. Um, you're welcome, Tammy. I'm gonna remember that when I see your name now. Um, all right, we're gonna get into some best practices and small shifts now. So I'm trying to give you little pieces of what I can to pique your interest and get you kind of uh, know where things are. And we're going to jump now into what you can actually do. Um, and so these are just some strategies 
we've talked a lot about pronouns um, and gender identity, gender markers. Pronouns matter to our students incredibly. We, we host uh, student experience panels consistently um, and our LGBT students, the most common thing we hear from them in terms of requests are that their teachers and education professionals honor and use their pronouns. They are understanding for the most part um, when people you know, mess up or make a mistake and then correct it and move on, but pronouns are incredibly important, um, especially to our LGBT youth. And it's just a way that we can remove ourselves from making assumptions about people based on how they look and let them tell us what their gender identity is. Sometimes people um, get very caught up and they're like, well, why would I have to add that to my to my, you know, my email signature or to my Zoom name? What then why am I not just then adding like where I'm from and what my favorite food is? Gender pronouns, um, aside from somebody's name, are the most common ways that we refer to other people. And so when we have students that are hearing the wrong pronouns over and over and over again throughout the day, um, it becomes incredibly wearing on them. Um, we see higher rates of suicide and depression in our trans youth. And one of the simplest ways that we can address that is by honoring and validating their gender identity and using the correct pronouns based on what they've told us. There's a link over here um, from TSER and it gives some basic pronouns that people use. This is not an exhaustive list here, um, but I think it's helpful. Um, and I would recommend one thing that you can do today just to make a difference is to put your pronouns in your Zoom name, put your pronouns in your email signature, ask people their pronouns when you meet them so that takes you out of the assumption role um, and invite people to use your pronouns and tell them what your pronouns are. It's an incredibly easy but helpful shift that we can all make. Um, got a question. Does it matter how old the student is calling them their preferred names or pronouns, third grader, graders versus middle or high school? Uh, that's a great question and it does not matter. So at any age that students are willing and able to express a preference for their name or gender identity, that's when our obligation begins. Third grade, we have a lot of students. And if we look back at that gender identity slide from the beginning, gender identity is starting to form around two or three years of age. So certainly by third grade, we have students who are exploring gender identity and maybe gender non-conforming, non-binary um, or transgender and honoring their preferred names or pronouns at that age is just as important as when they get into middle or high school. Uh, what does the Z sound like? Z, zero, zeros is how you pronounce uh, that set of pronouns. I don't see it a lot, um, but it is one that I have seen. And so knowing how to say it is important. And if you ask somebody, they can also explain how to pronounce it. But Z, zero, zeros, and I can go through all of them too. Uh, Z is speaking, I listen to zir or hear, and the backpack is zeros is how you would pronounce those. So hopefully that's helpful. Um, one question I get a lot with pronouns is for uh, gender non-binary pronouns for educators. And so I'm gonna put it into the chat so you can see it. Um, but this is the equivalent to um, Mr. or Mrs. It is the non-binary or gender neutral form of that address to an educator and it's pronounced mix. So I know a lot of non-binary friends um, and educators who ask their students to call them Mix, you know, Weathers, Mix Weathers, whatever their last name is. So I do get that question quite a bit about how educators who are non-binary can refer to themselves or other non-binary educators. Um, we got a question about what does zero mean. So you'll see, you'll see at the bottom of that chart, zero is across the bottom in purple. Across the top of the chart, you'll see the subjective, objective, possessive, and reflective, reflexive versions. And so you can just kind of look up he, she, those are the most common ones. Her, him, that is uh, the zero equivalent, if that helps to make any sense. So it's the objective form of the Z pronoun. It gets a little complicated, I know. Uh, we've gone through the gender support plan for allowing students to kind of define how they would like to be referred to, but just generally using inclusive language is incredibly helpful. And I talked about my son Hendrix in the beginning kind of highlighting for me um, from, a, from a parent community perspective, 
ways or gaps that I saw. And so my son is a donor conceived child. He has three moms. So my ex-wife, myself, and my wife now. Um, and so when we go to events or, you know, we're signing papers for school and it says mom or dad um, or parent signature and parent signature, it's really hard for him, I think, to understand as an eight-year-old why the forms do not reflect his reality. And so it's an opportunity for us to have a lot of great conversations about how it feels to be excluded. And I think it helps for him to build empathy and be more aware um, but imagine the inclusivity that we could build for students like Hendrix if we just had a space that said, you know, parent or guardian here, as opposed to um, listing it out. We also see a lot of things um, in policies or verbiage that comes home from the school that says, when the student arrives to school, he slash she should dot, dot, dot. Another great way of shifting language just in a really uh, minute way is to say there. And then we can be more inclusive of more people instead of this binary he or she. So there are small shifts that we can make that make a huge amount of difference for a lot of these students and families. When he went to preschool, there was donuts with dad day. That was another, um, you know, a way that we were trying to bring people into school, but recognizing that we were excluding a lot of families and students who maybe didn't have dads, not just my child, who's a donor conceived child, but um, you know, kids whose parents were off fighting a war somewhere, parents, dads who had died or passed away, um, single parent homes. So just shifting that gender inclusive language for one group really helps to shift that inclusivity for all groups I found. Separating children by gender is another one that we see a lot. Um, I love my kids and they are super great advocates for LGBT youth. They went to an after school program a couple of years ago, pre COVID, and they would line up boy girl every day before lunch um, and have the kids come out. And my daughter, who I think was nine or 10 at the time, um, had a non binary friend that she had met at camp. And her friend had expressed, you know, I don't know which line to go in. And my daughter went to the staff and said, Hey, like, can we not line up boy girl? And the response to her, based on her words, right? She's, nine or 10 at this time, so we can't confirm the validity of this, but was um, that she was too young to be knowing about and talking about these things and just to go get back in line. Um, so separating children by gender, even if it's that one student that doesn't quite know where to go or doesn't feel that they fit in, um, we can remove that responsibility from students by just coming up with more inclusive ways of separating or grouping children. And so at the bottom of the slide, you'll see just a few examples. Um, but first letter of their last name, birth months, the color of clothing that they're wearing that day, what pet they own. Um, so thinking more inclusively, and there's a great guide I showed on the last page, this pink one beyond the binary. If you click on that, it's also got some really great ideas in there as well. Gender neutral restrooms um, right now is a super hot topic. And there are actually some laws in California that are helpful to us around all single user restrooms must be gender neutral. So that has been incredibly helpful, but we still have a lot of schools um, that are older buildings, their facilities were not designed to have gender neutral restrooms available to staff and students. Um, so I wanted to share just a couple of resources on this slide with you. In San Diego Unified, one of the things that we did with our youth was to create a gender neutral restroom caucus where they came together and shared um, their concerns, their needs. They got some information about the laws that we are bound to as adults, because it's not always just as easy as taking off one sign from the bathroom door and putting up a new one. Um, we really have to look at building codes and our facilities to see how we can make this work for everybody. So the link here is actually a tool that you can use to engage students or adults in conversations around gender neutral restrooms. There's a bright bluish purple document here that's an explainer. So for some of our gender neutral restrooms at events, we would put this explainer up for people who weren't really aware or understanding of what a gender neutral restroom was. And it just gave them a better understanding of why it was there and who it was designed to support. Um, so please feel free to use both of those tools in your conversations because I know this is coming up a lot for me in, in work from districts across the state who need some support here. 
curriculum, incredibly important. Um, we have a responsibility as educators um, to provide fair and inclusive representation of LGBT community in our curriculum. So I just wanted to support that initiative by providing some resources here for you all to use in your counseling office, to share with your teacher friends. Um, but there's a ton of great material out there to support SB 48 or the Fair Education Act, um, where we can have more positive conversations and have more representation of LGBT people in our curriculum. So all of those are linked. You can click on all of them and check those out. And then inclusive environment. Um, all of this is based on the research that I've done through GLSEN's school climate survey. Inclusive environment is another big area that students are requesting to feel seen and validated. And so having pictures of LGBT people up on the walls, um, having posters, the one I've, I've provided here is from Learning for Justice, which is for, formerly Teaching for Tolerance. But it's a sim I want my LGBT students to feel included, valued, safe, seen, heard, respected. There is an initiative called Out for Safe Schools that offers some uh, schools badges that you can wear on your lanyard at school, posters that you can put up in your office or classroom. Um, there's little flags that you can get. So there are all kinds of ways that we can amplify visibility and inclusivity in our environment. Um, one really powerful way and a great entry point for counselors um, and support staff is to start a GSA or to support your GSA at your school. GSA used to represent Gay Straight Alliance. It has since kind of morphed into a gender and sexuality alliance, which is a more inclusive way. Um, so it's not just gay and straight. Um, but we find that when there is a GSA on site, the feelings of safety are amplified for all students, even the ones who don't go to the GSA. It's just knowing that it's there. And so I've linked a 10 step guide from GSA network on how to start up a GSA if you don't already have one. Um, and I started a GSA at my middle school when I was a classroom teacher. So if you're interested in doing that work, please use my contact info. I would love to share stories and help get you started with that. It's incredibly powerful for young people at school. The other thing I mentioned earlier that we at the county have some student experience panels, um, great. You know, it's hard for teachers, educators, um, adults in education sometimes to listen to other adults, but they are such better listeners when we're hearing from youth, as it should be. Let's hear directly from youth about their experiences. And so I liked to have students come in to my trainings and professional learning sessions and actually lead large portions of it because I think that they are the experts on their own experience. And this here, what I've attached is a guide that was made by students on how to incorporate students into your professional learning so that they can speak on their own experiences. But as we all know, the next step after listening, hearing from our students, creating opportunities for them to speak is to actually listen to what they're saying and, and begin to make steps towards action, um, shifting things within our system, within ourselves, so that these outcomes start to shift for our LGBT students. So I just wanted to share, these are pulled from the HRC uh, School Climate Survey. And I think when we do this listening nationally or locally at our school site or within our district, it really can help inform the initiatives that we take on, the budget that we choose to spend and how we spend it. Um, and it's a great way of you know, building psychological safety and trust within your school community. So create those opportunities but then also listen to what students are saying and take action. And I'm closing now with just a few things. I am so on time. I'm proud of myself. This never happens. Uh, everybody, you know, is at a different place on our personal journeys, on our personal, you know, where we feel comfortable and where we can enter this conversation. Schools and districts are all at different places. So there's not an expectation that everybody is you know, at level 10 right now, but taking what you've learned today, taking your entry point and your comfort level, your level of safety, what is it that you can do today or tomorrow to create a small shift, right? We talked about putting your pronouns in your Zoom name. Can you put your pronouns in your email address? Can you find and identify board policy that you have that you might be able to share during Pride Month? 
Can you sign up for another professional learning session to deepen your understanding of this community? There are small things that we can do. So it doesn't matter where you're at right now, but how are you gonna start this work? And hopefully today gave you some resources or some entry points that you can use to really take that first step or take some next steps on your journey. Um, I wanted to share now just some resources that you can go back to. We're not gonna get into all of them because there's just so much, um, but just so that you know it's here. Um, this is the youth experience panel that I was discussing throughout the presentation here. It's awesome, these kids are amazing. Um, it's a little bit over an hour, but check it out. Um, I wanted to share some specific information to our community. So resource mapping is a great way for your team to look at what's around you and how to leverage it. There's a tool you can use here to do that. Um, but then at the bottom of this, you'll see a bunch of icons. Those are all linked to the websites for those organizations so that you can start helping families and students get connected, right? This might be your first LGBT session um, and you might not know all of the answers, but you can't just remain in the background, right? You can't just not say anything. So as you're getting your wings, as you're becoming more informed and aware of best practices and laws and policies, know that there are organizations that are designed to support you and students and offer these um, to students and families who might need them. So you can click along and click on any of those resources you see there at the bottom. Uh, these are some youth drop-in centers that are in San Diego County. So if you are in San Diego County, please feel free to check these out. Um, I've worked with all of these organizations, so they are vetted and highly recommended. There are support groups and services. These are um, San Diego County, but they also offer, some of them offer um, virtual sessions. So if you are outside of San Diego, but you really have a family member or a student who needs some support, direct them to these because there are some virtual options. There are some resource centers where you can just go online, um, get connected to activities, but also get some resources and information. Again, these are all clickable on the icon here. These are resources that are specific for educators, ed professionals. Um, I really love all of them, so it's, it's hard to narrow it down. Um, but I wanted to see if anybody had questions. That's the close of everything I have for you. These are the documents. So we were talking earlier about um, how can I respond to parents who want this name and pronoun to be read for their child or listed for their child. This LGBT FAQs is where you're gonna wanna start looking. Um, it's got that language to kind of respond in an educated way to concerns like that. And then we also have a San Diego County Office of Ed guide over here. Um, that is super comprehensive. Um, and so if you're looking for support on pronouns or restrooms or gender support plans, you'll wanna look at that document. Um, what else we got? We started, we've got a podcast here um, where we talk about the importance of pronouns that you can check out. It's about 25 minutes long. It's linked here. And I shared with you my contact information here so that as questions come up or as hopefully you're trying to to walk into some of these action steps and, and you have a question or a concern, please feel free to use it. I would love to be a support to you. We've got like seven or eight minutes left for questions and I would love to answer any questions that you might have. So feel free to drop those in the chat. And as you're putting those questions in the chat and filling out the survey, um, I just wanna say thank you so much, Ebony. I learn something new every time you present and share. And I think, you know, in, at this point, the adults are the probably the biggest learners about all of this. When you talk to kids, they know, and kids are supporting kids who are different, who, um, you know, are part of this community. And so it's really important that we as an adult listen and take the time to understand and really utilize and change in our practice some of the terms that we're using. So if you ever have a question, Ebony is someone that you can ask anything about and she will not judge. She will not um, go. She'll just give you the facts and say, this is how it is. And, and I just appreciate that so much. She makes it very safe to ask any questions. So, uh, oh, we do have a question in the chat. Uh, do you have any advice on training our staff to be yes. more inclusive and make our school more welcoming environment for our youth? 
Totally. So um, I came from San Diego Unified to the county a little bit like two days over a year ago now. Um, and one of the first things I did coming in right before Pride Month was obviously figure out a way to get us into the Pride Parade. And if you aren't going to the Pride Parade, it's July 16th this year, San Diego Pride, be there, be square. Um, but also to create some professional learning around um, LGBT youth and how we can best support them. And so we offer a three session and some coaching packages. And if you're interested in looking at that um, to maybe attend or to look at that as a model for how to kind of ease folks into this work, please feel free to email me and I can share that with you. I would say assessing where your community is at um, in terms of being inclusive, having difficult conversations, because you can't really have this conversation, especially in today's climate, without a certain level of psychological safety and trust within your team. So after you've assessed kind of where you're at, it might be best to start with a more broad sense of equity before kind of getting into the really specific LGBT community work. Um, but yeah, I would say starting if you're starting with LGBT work and you wanna find the biggest bang for your buck for being inclusive, um, check out some of those documents that I linked on that page, especially the pink one beyond the binary, um, because it's just as simple. Like my son's principal, they have these Monday morning meetings and he just says, good morning, boys and girls. And they all go crazy. And I'm sitting in the back like, but what about the not boys and girls? And so I email and I'm saying, can you just take that out and say, good morning, young scholars, good morning, students, good morning, superheroes. Um, and it's the little things like that that seem to be, um, you know, people don't feel super uncomfortable doing that, but it allows for a great shift for that one student um, who might not identify as boy or girl. So start with the language, assess where your community's at, figure out the best entry point. And if you need support doing any of that, please feel free to, to reach out. And I know that I've had uh, people reach out to me as well, and I always pass along Ebony's contact information because she is phenomenal and she will get uh, a wonderful training out to your staff. So please, please keep her contact information for any questions you may have. All right, well, I'm not seeing anything more in the chat, but you all have her email address. You have my email address. So if you need to reach out, please do. This is such an important topic for our, for our community and for our kids. So please become those advocates out there. Our kids need you. And I wanted to say before you take off, if you're still here, I am in the queer community, visibly queer, actively queer, and I am learning new letters, acronyms, definitions every day. So if you're feeling like, oh my gosh, me too. Um, but learning and, and figuring out where we go next is the fun part. So just know you're not alone and uh, we're in this together. Thank you so much for your time. It's always my pleasure to talk about how we can best support young people, especially LGBT youth. And we've got some Star Trek, is it Star Trek? No, it's Star Wars. Star Wars fans in the chat too. All so, right. Everyone. Thank you so much, Ebony. And I hope all of you have a wonderful day. <clears throat> Please join us again. We have uh, three more webinars this week and we'd love to see you come back and be a part of those conversations. Thank you again, Ebony. Thank you.